then um, we'll we'll open up a discussion opportunity on each topic. We'll do one at a time. We've got uh, some time allotted for each topic, which I'll go into in a minute. Uh, and then if there's time at the end, we'll wrap up uh, with some information on our next steps and some things that you all could, can look forward to over the next few months. So I should have put this slide first, I guess. Uh, <laughs> today's meeting is being recorded, as Michelle mentioned. Uh, we've got a couple of people here from MDE that are going to help us with um, responding or calling on folks. Um, if you uh, raise your hand, you can uh, raise your hand and unmute yourself once you're called on to ask a question or leave a comment. Again, you also can use the chat function. Um, we'll be monitoring both the chat function and the raised hand uh, indicators. And we'll make sure that uh, all the comments in the chat are read to everybody in the room here and we have an opportunity to respond, as well as um, if you raise your hand, we'll we'll call on you and unmute yourself. Um, please otherwise stay muted and uh, turn off your camera. That helps with bandwidth and it helps also to avoid distractions. Again, um, I did say that um, our regulations and comments and previous rec meeting recordings are all posted on our ASTORM website, and this one will be posted there as well. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to break down our proposals into these four topics, precipitation and design storms, managing water quality impacts and providing channel protection, managing for flood risk and conveyance capacity analysis. I'll read uh, the, I will read the requirement that was proposed in April on the different topic. And then we have a certain amount of time that we're going to allot for discussion on that topic. If you will, please try to keep your comments and questions pertaining to the topic at hand. Uh, we may end up having extra time at the end where we can go back and revisit a topic. If necessary, if we run out of time and there's still a lot of comments and questions that we want to continue the discussion, we can either have another follow-up meeting or and or there's always that opportunity where you all can send us, call us, give us a call at work, you know, at, on our work uh, numbers or send us an email or, you know, something in writing if you have a particular issue that you want to want to bring up. That's always available. Uh, but again, if if, if the group wants to, we could also have a follow-up meeting discussion. All right, so we've got 15 minutes for precipitation and design storms, 30 minutes that we're allotting for managing water quality impacts and providing channel protection, we've got 20 minutes to talk about managing for flood risk, and then 30 minutes at the end to talk about conveyance capacity analysis. So with that, I'm going to just go right, get get right into it. Um, are there any, do we have any comments or questions at this point or should uh, Michelle or Jillian? Michelle and Jillian are going to be our moderators. Yes. So if you'd like to raise your hand and it looks like Neil Weinstein, would you like to go ahead? Um, somebody was saying something. I heard a rumor about the rational method being no more available or the curves for it, is that true? Um, I'm, well, let's, let's I'm, worried get... about sizing, I'm worried about sizing small pipe sizes and small drainage areas. Okay, so hold that thought. Let me, I'm not sure if that's where that's gonna be discussed. Um, hold that thought, Neil. We'll, we'll, we'll bring that back. We'll bring that back to you in a second. Let me, uh, let's go through the de precipitation des and design storms first. I think rational method, maybe that discussion can happen. Well, I'm not even sure where that's maybe in the flood risk management um, topic that might be more pertinent to that topic. So let's start with precipitation and design storms. Um, so our proposal in April was to update our design storms based on updated precipitation data. And this was essentially going to be replacing our design storms that we currently have in our design manual. That's table 2-1. We're going to continue to stay with a 24-hour event. Um, instead of using TP40, we're proposing to update our 
design uh, storms using NOAA Atlas, NOAA Atlas 14, the 2006 uh, version, and adjusting that for climate change using the Marissa tool that includes uh, county level change factors that are based on, uh, I think it's the high emission scenario for th the time period projection of 2050 to 2100. So essentially what you end up with is an updated table 2-1 with new uh, design storms for each county for the two year, 10 year and 100 year, uh, 24 hour events that is based on NOAA LS14 with a climate change factor. Okay, now this is your time to talk. Uh, are there any unintended consequences with this proposal that you can uh, let us know about or that you are concerned about? What do you know that we don't know? Do you have questions specifically about this preci these precipitation updates or design storm updates? Yes, Kim Grove, would you like to speak? Yes, good afternoon. Um, my only question is then I guess we're, there had been talk about whether or not the 24 hour storm was the correct design storm to use. It, it appears that uh, MDE is saying, yes, we're gonna still stay with the 24 hour design storm. Yes, so um, actually I have, I have little notes for myself. If I don't hear certain questions from you, I'm gonna prod you with them. And that was one of the things I was gonna ask about was, um, how do folks feel about the 24-hour design storm and whether um, that represents the conditions that we're having to manage or the, the let's say the flooding that is that we're seeing that's occurring more often and whether we even have enough information to go from go to an alternative type of storm event. Um, to answer your question specifically, yes, we're sticking with the 24-hour design storm for now. That doesn't mean that we have given up on the idea that that we need to start thinking about shorter duration events. Um, I think one of the concerns that we have is that we don't have enough information on the data to help us uh, de determine what those events would be and that that would be a future phase. And let me just back up one minute and say that this proposal, if you remember back in April, we were talking about different phases of um, uh, uh, regulation changes. What can we move forward with now? What can we, uh, what do we need to, to do more research on and have more discussions on? Uh, what we proposed in April was a 24 hour event. I think looking at alternative events is definitely something that's important, but the question is, do we have enough data? Are we ready to go move forward with something like that now? Or is it something we need to continue to work on? Uh, to further that point, I've got a comment from the chat from Andrew Miller. Um, and I see a question a question above that, but just want to add uh, at this point while we're still talking about this. Um, the comment is, we have talked about the issue Kim raises at length in the urban waters flood team. For small urban watersheds, the most important durations are probably 30 minutes to at most three hours. The Atlas and Marissa change factors should work for those durations, although Atlas 14 itself is, itself is based on relatively few observations at shorter durations. Yeah, Stu. Andy, that's great information you're putting in the chat. Um, do you have references, research that uh, backs that up? If you do, please share it with us. Um, so, uh, like, I won't bother turning on my camera. It's too complicated. Um, <laughs> so, we've looked at shorter durations, and I mean, I, I guess what I would say is, those of us in the urban flood team, there's a bunch of us actually in this meeting. I've discussed this at some length. Kim talks about it all the time. That the cities, the cities. Uh, speaking just about Baltimore City, and Kim, I'm just channeling what Kim has had to say. But what we've seen from our own looking at the storm data is that um, the the greater number of um, incidents that cause significant street flooding are from short duration, intense bursts, effective rainfall, 
Um, we have been working on various aspects of this for a while. We've actually generated our own um, uh, non-stationary analyses of um, of uh, uh, intense of uh, rainfall amounts for different recur for different recurrence intervals and durations. Um, there's a recent paper that came out. We're working on others, and we also have data, at least for the, based on radar, for the Baltimore City metropolitan area. But that's not something we're going to be able to use for climate change projections. I think Marisa is probably about the best thing you're going to get right now for climate change projections. Um, but I would say everybody that I know who looks at this pretty much agree. Shorter durations are where you have the biggest problems, at least in small urban watersheds. I'm not speaking for larger watersheds or, or rural watersheds. I know Kim talks about a lot of the things too, but I know she talks about this because we're in a lot of meetings where it comes up. <laughs> we talk a lot about it too, so that's that's why we're curious yeah. what you have, so we can share that. Yeah. In the same uh, as long as I'm talking, I'll just respond to what Megan Floyd posted also about Atlas 15. I think it's gonna be Atlas 15. They are working on that. It's going to take them several years. Uh, you probably can't wait long enough until it comes out, and it will still be based on current data. That will not be a climate change scenario, so as far as I'm aware. So you'll still need adjustment factors, and Marisa is based on Atlas 14. So I think the logic for what you're doing there is because it's going to take longer to get to that point. That would be my guess. And when my colleague Jim, Jim Smith works a lot with the NOAA folks, I could consult him on this too. Okay, so um, I think we have a couple of things in the chat to maybe Jillian or Michelle might want to read before we go to the hands. So we just referenced uh, Megan Gloyd's question about NOAA Atlas 14 and whether or not um, with the new version being planned to release, whether or not it makes sense to reference uh, NOAA Atlas 14. Um, and then we have a comment in the chat from... Matt Johnson, uh, I think it would depend upon what the adjusted 24-hour design storm is. For example, is the new future 24-hour design storm equal or greater to the three-hour storm? We just want to understand whether or not the 24-hour storm is a good umbrella criteria in reference to uh, using the 24-hour design storm as a baseline. All right, and scrolling down, we've got a question from Neil Weinstein. Uh, can we explore the cost difference to convey these events and how much of a difference the damage would be? Good point, Neil. Keep that uh, in the back of your mind, and we can talk about that later, uh, you and me, separately. All right, the next yeah. comment we have is from Robert Balthurst. We've got uh, the original CPV requirement required storage that effectively created a need to store the entire runoff volume from the one year storm. So storm duration wouldn't be as significant as, of an issue uh, unless we have a larger rainfall depth to store. And then from King Grove, I was planning to share the data on rainfall and stream level response. The more intense storms have a bigger response, but still have the same 24 hour precipitation. Okay, next question from Meredith Neely. We have uh, what projection slash future time period and climate scenario would be proposed? Okay, before we go to Kim's next comment, how about if you call on some people with their hands raised? Sure. Would Mark Etheridge like to speak? Sure. I'll give it a shot. Um, take my hand down here. I think we have to keep in mind what our goals are here. The shorter duration uh, returns on the storms might be the most important for urban flooding. But is our goal protecting urban flooding or essentially, or is it essentially a uh, uh, protection of the receiving stream system? The receiving stream systems may May, may be better protected by looking at a 24-hour duration storm. Uh, we're we're getting into a realm here where we haven't been before in looking at really concentrating on urban flooding. 
um, we have to look at these events to see if we're going to reach the goal that we're looking to reach in the overall. So we may have two different uh, effects based on what our goals are in terms of these, uh, these storm return events. That's all I have to say. Okay, and Jeffrey Knopf? Uh, yeah, I have um, two comments. The first is that I see someone's using an AI assistant to take notes. That's, um, we were just briefed in State Highway that that's not allowed under state law. So I would ask that that be turned off. John's note taker. My first comment. Um, secondly, I'm certainly a fan of shorter duration storms. I think that that better reflects um, the flooding that we're seeing. Uh, however, if you wanted to punt this issue until later and gather some research, that would be, I think, an appropriate way to go. Okay. MDE's recording this, I see. Yes, we are recording this. So how about if we go to um, Rob, so Bob Bathurst, your comment, let's hold on that comment possibly until our next discussion about CPD. Um, and maybe I think Kim Grove was, was next. Yes, we've got a question from Kim Grove. Uh, would you consider a different duration for qualitative control than quantitative control? Uh, all those storms with little to no response, or as as those storms with little to no response. Sorry, that last line was trying to finish up what I got. Uh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> yes, okay. Sorry yes. about that. Yes. Who who needs AI when I can mess up things like that? Yes. Okay, so a number of comments I'm hearing about, you know, the purpose of the design storms and tailoring the design storm to meet the purpose, which makes sense. All right, I've got a comment from Andrew Miller. Um, as Kim indicates, the shorter duration storms may have a significant fraction of total of total 24 hour precipitation, but much higher intensity. The 24 hour design storm may have more intense periods embedded within them, but we might need to look at whether those are as intense as we see for those shorter duration. Uh, we do both. We do look at both stream flow and precip and the biggest peaks, again, in small urban watersheds, often are associated with much more with those short duration intense storms. I guess I do have a follow-up question for Andy, and that is, um, what do you have a, could you give us a range or a feel for what you mean when you say short, uh, small urban watersheds? I'm talking about generally, for the most part, under 10 square miles. Um, I mean, most of our Baltimore area, suburban, urban, suburban watersheds, they may be tributaries to larger watersheds, but if you take something, say, the size of the Gwynn's Falls or the Jones Falls, those are much less responsive at those very short durations. Um, but uh, if you go to someplace like Dead Run, Mine Bank Run, Herring Run, uh, um, and places of that size and maybe a little bit larger, and particularly in more densely, uh, you know, uh, higher impervious cover areas, they are responding to anywhere from three minutes to an hour uh, to sometimes the really huge rare storms might even be three hours, but um, most of the flood peaks are relatively short duration. If you go out into the more rural watersheds out, out let's say in Baltimore County, I'm speaking mostly because I know more of the, of the watersheds in Baltimore County, that's just not gonna be true there. And so it really depends what it is you're trying to protect against. On the other hand, I would assume that for the stormwater regulations, it's places that are being developed that that are um, many of them are going to look like what we're talking about. Um, it, even if you go out to like uh, oh uh, you know the Owings Mills area, you're not going to get as intense response as rapidly as you do in some of these other suburbs, but. So, so it's it really depends on the water flow. All 
All right. Um, if anybody, if everyone doesn't have any more comments and questions regarding this, we are coming up on that 15 minute time. If we want to move on. All right, um, let's see our next topic. Water quality and channel protection. Okay, um, this is a big one. And this is why we provided or allotted more time to this discussion. Um, I'm gonna try to get through this without saying ESD volume, which I already said. So our proposal in, that we put out in April talked about separating out the channel protection volume from the water quality volume, having two separate criteria um, and managing those two separate criteria in different practices. Uh, the water quality volume, which is which includes the recharge volume for the most part, is proposed to be based on capturing and treating the runoff from 95% of the average annual rainfall in, in the state um, we uh, cr created two regions uh, for determining what that number or value is. For the central and eastern Maryland, it would be two inches of rainfall. For the western part of the state, it would be 1.4 inches of rainfall. And the requirement was to treat that, run that rainfall, the runoff from that rainfall, in an ESD practice. This would be the practices that are listed in Chapter 5. The channel protection volume was to be based on the one-year 24-hour design storm adjusted for climate change. Um, it must be managed in a structural practice, and currently that means the practices that are located in Chapter 3 of the design manual, and it would apply to both new development and redevelopment. Okay, so with that brief summary, uh, I'll open it up for a discussion again. Are there any un unintended consequences that we're not thinking about? Do you have questions about these proposals? What do you know that we don't know? Mark, Mark Etheridge. Hi. Um, if we're gonna talk about splitting these up and treating them as separate practices, this might be something that would be pertinent to large subdivisions and places where you actually have the room to do those kinds of things but from an actual standpoint of effectiveness on smaller projects there's no room to do that i also wonder about the very small drainage areas being treated for uh quantity of cpv what do you want to call it uh, on a small project you're not going to be able to have a control orifice or weir that's even small enough to do much with that i think those those volumes are much better treated in the previous the ESD type practices because we can capture those and we can detain those. If we're talking about moving to CPV in a chapter three device, my understanding of chapter three devices is they don't do a lot of attenuation. Are we going to set an attenuation, uh, a, a detention standard, a release rate standard on the chapter three practices? And if that's the case on small drainage areas, again, how are we going to achieve that? I, my problem here really is with practicality. Uh, I think I'm going to have a lot of problems in Montgomery County in our highly developed urban watershed uh, uh, trying to put this into practice. Thank you. If I could just follow up with a question, Mark. Um, I believe you said, you know, I can't remember the exact terms you used, but it was something like small developments. Mm -hmm. What What is... What do you mean? I, I understand what large subdivisions are, but um, uh, sure. if you could, if you could help, maybe better or further qualify sure. the smaller sites you're talking about. I don't want to apologize first. I'm normally not very cogent, but I've been up for 30 hours now, so I'm probably on the verge of insanity. I'm talking about small urban projects, like a one-acre redevelopment project in downtown Bethesda, where we have a lot line to lot line building that's being constructed. I'm talking about a three lot subdivision one existing residential lot being subdivided into three smaller lots. Uh, we have no room for dry wells on those lots. We have no room for anything on those downtown Bethesda projects. It is extremely difficult to implement something and to split it up and increase the pressure on that implementation. 
I see this as being something that we are going to have in the regulations, but not being able to achieve. All right, we've got a comment from uh, Robert down in the chat uh, refer uh, referencing the proposal to separate the CPV from the WQV. Um, given the volumes needed, I can't see the practicality in keeping these separate, nor is there adequate real estate av available. Then the question of application to redevelopment. All right, I've got another comment from, from Kim Grove. Economically, this removes any incentive for redevelopment. The release rate standards come back to the design storm. If most large storms occur within three hours, why should we be retaining the flow for 24 hours instead of six hours? I also agree with Mark that small projects, uh, 5,000 square feet to 0.5, acres LOD is difficult to install one BMP, let alone an ESD practice and a structural practice. I've then got a question from Mitchell in the chat, perhaps not specific to uh, WQ slash CP. When we talk about adjusted for climate change and the selection of certain art CPs, time windows, etc., how do we include and manage uncertainty or variabilities in the projected design storms or that arise from decisions on what informs the projections? And then finally, a comment from Meredith in the chat. Uh, one size fits all approach is not practical. Please consider establishing thresholds and or tiers, looking at things like site size or zoning. All right, okay, stop. Days, for, yeah, I'll stop. stop, for <laughs> stop for in. I'm going to um, ask Stu Comstock if he has any thoughts or responses to what we've heard so far. Uh, what I'm hearing is that you guys want more options. Uh, and, uh, you know, that certainly that's noted at this point. Uh, you know, the, the question becomes how 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 far do we go on the option side? How many options do we give you for addressing these issues without making it too difficult for you guys to actually implement the program? So the balance there is is something I want everyone to keep in the back of their mind is the balance between um, you know making the program relatively easy to implement and yet still give you the options or the tools that you need to be able to effectively uh, design urban stormwater. I think that's a good point. Um, the one thing that I want to point out as a follow-up to what Stu said is that there are options in the, in the regulations in the design manual already for alternative compliance. Um, so I think the important thing, though, to recognize for all of you is that when alternative compliance is implemented, MDE needs to know about it. We need to have to weigh on whether what is being asked for meets the minimum criteria. Kim Grove, would you like to add something? Yeah. Um, what Jennifer, what exactly are you meaning when, when you're saying there's options for alternative compliance? Because in the regulations I that as being more stringent, not less. There's alternative compliance, which is equal, equally stringent as an alternative, but MDE needs to be part of the conversation as to whether it meets a minimum criteria. And that's in the regulations. I don't think it's probably, I, I don't know if it's called out specifically in the design manual, Stu, you'll have to let me know if that is the case. Definitely in the regulations currently. Kim, I can uh, get back to you on where, where it is called out in the regulations specifically. Yeah, I don't, Jennifer, I don't believe it's in the existing design manual because it would have been a policy and not, um, something that we would cover in the design manual. But the idea again here, as Jennifer mentioned, is that uh, as long as the department has reviewed and approved it uh, and the policy meets the intent of the regulation, we would consider alternative solutions. Uh, that that has never changed. So that's what she's mentioning. So so is this more of um, within, within, is this more related to you could have some alternative policies based on a watershed master plan or watershed assessment that but I've always read that policy as being as stringent. And so if you have something where it's got to be CPV plus that uh, water quality is separate, then my dog will disagree with you. No, um, then 
that still already seems like a really high bar and having an alternative will likely just result in the local jurisdiction just getting a lot of fees in lieu that they really don't want to deal with either. Okay, so fee in lieu is not an alternative compliance that's, that's equally stringent. Fee in lieu is available as a redevelopment alternative currently, but not something that we would we would accept as an alternative compliance for new development. Um, yes, watershed studies are specifically mentioned in many of the statements in our regulations where we're talking about alternative compliance. Um, what you're pointing to, I think, is important is that we want to make sure that where where we have alternative compliance statements, if we mean flexibility for the local jurisdictions to come up with alternatives that are equally as stringent, we want to make sure that that's clear to you all as well. I would want to go back and look at the regulation language, uh, and that's part of this whole discussion. We're talking about design manual right now, but don't forget, we've got regulations that go with the design manual. We are changing those regulations as well. Um, this is an opportunity if there are statements like alternative compliance in there that aren't as flexible as you'd like or not as clear, this is the time where we might want to make those changes as well. All right, getting back to the chat. I will pick up where we left off. All right, so I've got a comment from Neil. Um, I have seen some jurisdic jurisdictions just go underground slash vault route for just about everything urban. Do we want that? And then comment from Justin Bell. As a designer, I have concerns with trying to meet the required uh, CPV release rate, not be feasible without the use of proprietary flow reducer device. Um, okay, before you go on, let's talk about the um, underground vault route. Um, so what I mentioned here on these proposed regulations is that chapter three practices are specifically called out. There are no underground vaults currently listed as an option for in chapter three in our, in our design manual. So that would be an alternative compliance discussion if that was something that was being proposed. All right, great. Um, we've got a comment in the chat from Nimish. Uh, this criteria may not be practical on Sorry. linear projects. Sorry, Jillian, let me, I wanna go back to Justin's. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Just, just to clarify, Justin. I think what you're saying is, I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. I think that what you're saying is that the release rate is difficult to meet because the drainage area is so small that the orifice would be so small. I think that's what you're trying to say. If, if, that, if I'm wrong, uh, please let me know. Or that, maybe you want to clarify. No, that is, uh, I believe, what we're talking about because the smaller, as these drainage areas get smaller and smaller, you look into the POI. Uh, based needs for meeting CPV, um, putting in a structure uh, BMP to uh, to meet that attenuation. Um, you end up usually with a uh, small drainage area. Uh, your footprint for your your facility can be constricted, um, and then the associated computation for uh, the maximum release rate um, typically just does not line up with um, your your orifice to head um ratio and then we're as designers you know there's we're look we're end up being pushed more towards proprietary um you know you know flow reducers that are available nowadays um which they were available earlier in my design career um but they do make the um the design a lot easier because they they can put in a cap um for that but uh, it just it pushes towards reliance on you know what is starting to become industry standard for using these flow reducers for, for various situations, but just kind of this is where it's moving towards is kind of what I was pointing out. Nimish has his hand raised. Would you like to add something? Yeah, I'll just clarify my question. That's why uh, I'd raised my hand. So meeting the water quality uh, for linear transportation projects, uh, Meeting water quality requirements uh, is not going to be an issue, but separating 
in two different facilities, given that uh, the drainage areas are going to be smaller. And um, if we put a, a storm or a pond or something to manage just the CPV, that's going to be very challenging in the areas where we have limited right of way. And, uh, uh, and also there is probably maintenance and stuff like that associated with it to keep, keep, that's going to be very challenging as a designer. When you say maintenance, do you mean because of the type of practices can yes. cause additional maintenance issues? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just curious uh, if there are any designers here that rep that do capital public works type projects at local at the local level that involve road widening or new roads. Um, I, we have some experience here with State Highway Administration and MDOT, uh, but I, mean, I am interested in hearing if if that, those the issues that we see MDOT and um, SHA deal with are similar to what is experienced at the local level when it comes to road design. Mark, would you like to go ahead? Short answer is yes, we do see the same thing because it's actually a physical impediment to uh, be able to build these things to begin with. And then once you wind up with a really small orifice or control structure of some sort, they tend to fail frequently and they're very hard to maintain. And if they're not maintained, they don't work, then they just shouldn't even be there. So we see the, exactly the same kind of things that Namish was talking about uh, on a local level as well, from my perspective. Okay, great. Um, moving right along here, we've got a comment from Jeffrey in the chat. A two inch water quality depth will limit feasible BMPs, especially for SHA's linear projects. Most pollutants are removed in the first flush, so I don't see how we are getting much additional water quality treatment pollution production by going to two inches. Uh, separating into two facilities will cause ROW issues and will add to maintenance needs. All right, next up, we've got a comment in the chat from Rick. Uh, will, there be, will there be an exemption for CPV, uh, and then in parentheses, WQV sites generating less than X, uh, CFS is currently two CFSs. Stu, would you like to add a comment? Yeah, I, I, I kind of want to jump in on, on some of this discussion about the CPV and the water quality volume of the two different facilities and the, you know, why does it have to be larger? Um, you know, it, it, it gets back to how many options you want for dealing with this dealing with these different volumes, uh, what makes sense uh, from a, a larger perspective. For example, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on Jeff just for a quick second. Um, you know, you have two inch water quality that will limit feasible BMPs, but you know, separating two facilities will cause right of way issues and will add the maintenance needs. But if we lessen the water quality volume, then we're getting less channel protection. So now you're definitely pushing yourself into two uh, BMPs. So, uh, you know, it, 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 where's the balance here, folks? And, and, and I guess what we're asking, is um, some input on you know where that balance point lies maybe two inches is too much but what is the right number and oh by the way if we separate it in two facilities uh what are the i'm going to go back to the alternative compliance i'm not going to say it necessarily as, as a separate requirement but if we come up with different options what will those options be to make this work um, I'm going to add on to that where Rick said, will there be an exemption for channel protection volume or water quality volume for sites generally generating less than two CFS? As we push these practices into smaller and smaller drainage areas, the, the, the two CFS becomes much more pertinent, but also as we start looking at smaller and smaller practices that have a filtering media and maybe pinholes on the downstream end, it becomes much more practical to, um, implement that. Now, again, as Mark mentioned, there's maintenance issues with this, and that's another thing we have to balance here. But 
you know, recognize that that two CFS rule dates back to the um, 80s and early 90s with the Budweiser can rule. You know, what, we, we have to put an orifice in a riser and that orifice can't be any uh, smaller than a Budweiser can because it's going to get clogged. Well, we can do other things now. So maybe we, we need to figure out where that limit is now and what would be more appropriate. Um, so Stu, let me jump in here um, about the Rick's comment. Just a question back to you, Rick. Um, you talk about exemption or what exemption is it that you're specifically referring to? An exemption from doing any management for CPV or uh, an exemption for, from the requirement to, to manage CPV in a separate practice? Or neither, or neither, maybe something else you're talking about. No, no, speaking of the feedback that we get from our development review community, when they have a, a small site per se, just um, something greater than 5,000 square feet is our exemption for needing stormwater management here in the city. So a, a single family house lot can therefore trigger stormwater management and then trying to make that house happen with stormwater management. And, you know, they, they get caught up on that 2CFS if they're over or under, but the ESD rules now are really, just as Stu said, maybe we can meet that in other ways, but that still is there in the regulations. Um, you can still find that language. Okay, yes, yeah, so I think so then that you're talking about the exemption from actually providing CPV at all. Okay, thank you. Do you um, I think Kim's, was Kim's next, Kim's comment? Yes, yep, sure is, and, and very topical with, with what is this right balance here. Um, Kim's comment, we want options that will be effective instead of conservatively overbuilt, um, and then along those same lines, the next comment slash question from Mark in the chat, uh, have we determined that current one-year treatment practices are not achieving effective protection of the receiving stream systems? What we're discussing will cause significant impact to development. And I'm wondering if this is really something that deserves this impactive of an approach. And then moving right along. We have Kim's comment slash question. Uh, has MDE developed example calculations on how the separate facilities would be designed, especially for the areas where the adjusted one-year rainfall depth is not much higher, uh, like Allegheny or Frederick County? Meaning not much higher than the proposed two inches used for the water quality volume, um, which I understand, yes, it's 1.4, but if you're having them diverted into separate parts and your qualitative control doesn't necessarily, the performance measures is to, you know, filter it through or what have you, but it's not necessarily gonna be retaining and have that runoff rate reduction. I'm just wondering if you've run any of those example calculations. No, we haven't. We're working on that stuff right now. Well yeah, to answer directly, we are in the process of doing that. And I'm going to talk about that at the end of the meeting because we're going to need some help from you all. Hopefully it won't be a big ask. Um, but yes, we we definitely need to go through some design examples of the proposals to see how they might. We need We need some hard numbers and data to back up a lot of the statements that we're hearing from you all today. And to support any changes that we propose that might cause impacts. We wanna make sure that we understand what the impacts are, but we need to have some hard numbers behind a lot of the statements. So going through some examples is gonna be helpful. I'm gonna put out here now that if, you know, so we're hearing some really good comments, but I haven't seen anything that demonstrates, you know, what de demonstrates the actual numbers or the reality of the comments, if that makes sense. I, I kind of need the backup information to really make significant changes. I think we could get you the backup information, but we can't do it in a format like this. I think it's a lot to that, ask for a lot of specific information in a, in a, in a format like yeah. this. 
understood, Mark, and that's, I'm not really asking you uh, for it in a format like this. I understand this is a difficult format even to have a conversation in. <laughs> so uh, understand, And but if you have, you know, really strong uh, feelings about certain parameters here that we're proposing and you have experience issues and you can pull out those examples and send them to us, that would be so helpful to us. So thank you. All right, jumping right back in, uh, just to stay on the topic of conversation that we've been discussing right now, I'm going to jump around a little bit in the chat. Kim Grove commented, uh, once you have the examples, I'm happy to put them into our H&H &H model, even scale it up to determine the effectiveness. Um, and then comment from Mark, uh, with strict stormwater management requirements that provide no effective alternative, such as partial waivers, for example, we risk denying development from going forward, and this will affect public transportation projects, house construction, community master plan, redevelopment, improvement projects, etc. Um, all right, and just before it gets absolutely lost, uh, Neil in the chat earlier said that the NH NCHRP slash TRB has a series of stormwater publications that will be useful. And just to Stu's point, if you could provide us links, that would be greatly appreciated. We'd love to check check those out. Um, all right, moving on to a question from Robert in the chat. Can you combine the water quality practice and place flow restriction on the underdrain pipe? The media will protect the small orifice from clogging. This will, however, make these facilities huge. And all right, and a comment from Robert in the chat. Uh, suggest GSI in the form of some of the enhanced Chapter 3 ponds could be added to Chapter 5. And that's that's everything in the chat so far. <laughs> so if anyone has any other questions, comments, feel free to raise your hand or add them. We've got about three minutes left before we are up on our 30-minute time here. Anybody from the more rural parts of the state wish to weigh in? We're hearing a lot from urban areas. We're hearing a lot from the central part of the state. Anybody, do we have anybody from the environmental community that wishes to weigh in at this point? How much time do we have left in this session? We have two minutes and 30 seconds. I started the timer when the slide changed over. Okay. Yep. okay, well, we can move on. As I said, if we have extra time at the end, we can come back to this, this, um, this discussion topic. So the next topic is Going to be managing flood risks. I hope this is a, a this might be a more straightforward topic to discuss. Um, the proposal that we put out in April, or we discussed in April, is to require quantity management of the 10-year, 24-hour event statewide. Uh, currently, it is it is required if a local jurisdiction knows of flooding that's occurring downstream and does not have, I believe, it's something like control over the floodway or something like that is what the requirement is currently. Uh, so this takes the decision off of the local jurisdictions and basically says statewide quanti quantity management is required for the 10-year storm. It is required for both new development and redevelopment projects. It would be based on the 10-year, 24-hour storm event adjusted for climate change. So again, those new design storms. And then there's the alternate design storms may be used if there's an MDE approved watershed study. This is kind of points back to those alternative compliance uh, statements I was talking about that are currently in the regulations. So I'll open this up to questions and comments. Um, again, are there any un unintended consequences that we aren't thinking about? What do you know that we don't know? Do you have concerns or questions? Jeffrey Knopf, would you like to add something? 
I'm just wondering what you mean by Q10 is required for redevelopment. How do you see that working? Can, is there a particular question? Or I mean, it would be the same as it would be required so for redevelopment. Is there a particular thing you're, you're thinking about that to the, you know, something more to that question? Well, if we're doing a project and there's really no change to impervious, but it's a redevelopment project, um, Q10's already met, right? So I'm just curious, what did you mean by Q10 for redevelopment? I think your point is well made. Okay. So it's not no change in really the current practice. If we Correct. were adding adding impervious area on a redevelopment project of course we have q10 so same from old to the new yes um and i, I don't know if i was clear you're managing post-development tenure or sorry pre-development 10-year 24-hour design storm adjusted with climate climate change to sorry post-development to pre-development but you're using the same design storm so it's both in the case of post-development post -development and pre-development you're using the 10 year, 24 hour design storm adjusted for climate change. Yes. Yeah, so, an and yes, Jeff, controls. your point. Yes. Your point's well taken. Thank you. Okay. All right. Comment in the chat from Kim Grove. Uh, if Kim has the same comment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All, all right. right. If you read it, then all good. <laughs> this is going to be a quick discussion. Nobody else. Stu, go ahead. I was just going to add to what you were saying that, you know, Jeff and Kim, you're absolutely right. If there was no change in the impervious area, there would be no change from the pre to post. Uh, but, you know, not all redevelopment maintains the same amount of perviousness. And currently the requirement is that you do 50% um, of the existing imperviousness plus 100% of the new. This would extend the 100% uh, of the new to that QP10 requirement. So if you had a site that was close to 50% and they added a significant amount of, of imperviousness, they might trigger a 10-year peak management requirement. You lost me, Stu. If they, if they significantly increase imperviousness on the site, they might reduce their existing imperviousness by 50%, but you know they have to at least look at the impacts of the new imperviousness on downstream flooding. But that's not considered redevelopment. Any increase is qualified as being a new development. So you're getting caught up in what we call redevelopment and new development. This apply, This statement applies to how a site is determined to be redevelopment or new development, not the actual redeveloped impervious area or new developed impervious area. So you look at the project as a whole. Is the project considered redevel a redevelopment project? And then therefore, if it's considered a redevelopment project, existing impervious area is treated differently than it would be if it's considered a new development project. That's what we're saying. It, it, we get hung up in this discussion in our own office. It's not whether the redeveloped, whether the existing imperviousness is redeveloped or not. It's the project as a whole, is it considered redevelopment or not redevelopment? You have to go to the definitions in our regulations. Stu, do you want to, have I, is there anything else you want to add to what I said? No, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and it does get back down to how redevelopment is defined both in the regs and, and uh, how, how projects are submitted because we do see a mixture of different uh, scenarios. But again, the other issue here might be that the, where the redevelopment is located might be in an area that is ex experiencing existing flooding. And currently, you know, uh, Local jurisdictions have the option to address that flooding, but uh, you know how often is that actually uh, mandated? In this case, we would be giving you more ammunition to do that. I think my what might clarify if this helps, Kim, is my second bullet. Maybe should have said QP10 is required for new development projects and redevelopment projects. Maybe that helps. Um, hopefully. I look, it, it I doesn't, but I don't think we need to spend more, more time on it. I think, okay. um, but I did make a suggestion. Feel free to create new terms or phrases so we can avoid this. We seem to use the same 10 words. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
Jennifer, the, the issue is saying Q10, Q10, Q10 could be required in a redevelopment job if you switch drainage divides. So uh, it's, a, it's a tough bullet point. I think we just move past it. I, if there's no change from previous, then we all know what we're dealing with. Kim, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, and I, I may, I'm going to already apologize for folks uh, on this. Um, Stu, I know a couple of years ago, you had mentioned the idea of using the current Atlas 14 for pre-development conditions or existing conditions and only applying the adjusted for post conditions, but that doesn't seem to be happening now. We're, we're putting the same precipitation on both sides of the equation now, right? Well, Kim, we, we will take your comments and consider them and possibly uh, um, you know, con consider them moving forward. So, you know. Oh, that wasn't a request. No, that wasn't a request. I was just <laughs> making sure that's what I was seeing. That is what you're seeing. Yes. And yes, we had in the past talked about over, I, I call that over management. So it's managing a future condition back to uh, an existing condition. I believe that is similar to what is being done currently in Pittsburgh and maybe other states or jurisdictions as well. Stu would know more about that than I do. Stu, do you want, you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, not really, not yet. I mean, I mean, the only thing I would add is, is the, the, what we're discussing here is just by moving the rainfall targets for both the pre and the post, are we really changing the existing requirement to, to address climate change? And, and I just throw that out there for, for consideration is if you're going to, make a meaningful change in the requirement for climate change, then, then you just can't move the starting point for both of the pre and post to the same level. You need to change the controls around a little more. So consider it and think about it, comment on it. And, and while we're here, I see, I see that Justin, if I may, Justin had a question. How is the QP10 adjusted for climate change? Is this based on using updated Atlas or MRSA data value by the designer or MDVE providing design values per county local? Um, it's, it's kind of tricky because MRSA doesn't necessarily provide 10 year estimates for each each county. Um, so we would have to uh, uh, use the available data to apply to that. And I think we've, we've got things on that already, but we've shown that. Okay, great. Uh, next question is from Jeffrey. Uh, will uh, we will have the will we have same QP waivers? Uh, title and major waterways is the question. Same waivers? Yes. So the only change here is the design storm. The fact, well, there's three changes that are posted there on the on the slide. It's statewide, the design storm. It applies to new development projects and redevelopment projects. Those are the changes. Okay, great. Um, we've got a comment from Robert. Uh, need flexibility to fit these storage volumes onto a site. Otherwise, we simply won't fit them. I love these, these statements about fitting things onto sites. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what it is that what site you're talking about, but I would assume that you start with basically a blank slate. And so are you talking about taking an existing site, existing design and trying to fit it back in? Yeah, that might be a problem. But if you know about it ahead of time, I'm not sure what you're what you mean by not being able to fit it on the site. Hi, Jennifer. I figured I'd take myself off from you for that. It's just, you know, I, I've done these computations so many times. You generate these volumes and, you know, roll back time. You would find efficiency in the fact that you're talking about a singular facility that stored potentially six or eight feet of water. Uh, nowadays, with uh, ESD practices uh, storing one foot of water, and thereafter, the volumes have to go horizontally outward. So you know, what's, what's the answer if you're, if you're consuming all the land with horizontally uh, space consuming features, it, it's just not going, it, it may achieve the goal, but it may also then 
uh, restrict any redevelopment or for that matter, uh, make any development um, very expensive. Uh, Mark, thank you. I I'm just trying to look at it from the practical perspective. Uh, there needs to be the ability to find a way to store the volumes, right? The volumes are the volumes. And uh, if we do an example project, we'll, we can, you know, sort out those volumes and then see what fraction of the land, which may be back in the 80s was 15% dedicated to stormwater, that may now be 50. Uh, so I'm just kind of pointing it out that way. But if, if I may respond, because I, I, this is in my neighborhood. Um, yeah, you know, if, if you're looking at not working with the people designing the site and, and working with the materials used throughout the site, what you're saying is actually very true. You're dealing with the symptoms of, of a development. But I think what we're asking is part of this, and we've been asking this since 2007, 2008, is to start thinking about the stormwater management of the site as part of the site's design and not the after effect of the symptoms of the site. So in these situations where you have a tight site and you maybe not have a storage area for all these volumes, there's alternative surfaces. There's other ways of dealing with this. There's alternative compliance paths. We ask that people start thinking about this and, and start considering, you know, integrating stormwater into that site design and not just uh, putting everything to the very back end of the site into a hole in the ground and saying, that's my stormwater management. So. Yeah, we're asking to be the designers to be a little more sophisticated, I think. Well, I'm, I'm still sorry, Bob, I, I missed a little bit of the beginning of what you said, because I had a very important call interrupt this wonderful presentation. So I apologize for that. But when you say flexibility, I don't think I think I don't think you're saying you, you can't do this work. You're saying we need maybe alternative ways to do it. Is that uh, what you're trying I, to say? I mean, I think Stu's heard me say this rave, and I think, uh, I, I guess maybe I'm just an old dog or something, right? I, I think that a pond is a wonderful BMP, and the wet ponds that we can design nowadays are quite the amenity. Communities like them. Uh, so I am more in the vein of, you know, ponds are spatially efficient. I am probably one of the outsiders on this. I'm exposing myself by saying this. I'm not, I'm pro environment. I think most people who know me know that about me. But the realization is, is these volumes, if they're put into devices that can only store a foot of water, the, the yield of land, right? If you go about either redeveloping or developing land, the, the real estate value is very expensive. So by the time you, go about doing a feasibility study, it, it could potentially, you know, what we're talking about cause a home price to maybe double or triple because you're not going to get as many houses on that same lot or parcel if you're held to these volumes and there's uh, BMPs that can only store very shallow volumes. And your alternatives? <laughs> well, Stu knows. He I know knows. what they are, but I want you to say what they are. I'm a firm believer in ponds that are designed. Well, I'm not going to go where you think I'm going. No, I'm talking about the, the ponds enhancements that were in the one document you guys published uh, that basically made them green stormwater infrastructure. I think that you know wet ponds, the ones that I've been exposed to that have done well, or been designed well, selfishly, I'll say I did a couple, um, that the communities love them. And in fact, there was a study uh, that uh, was presented at the Center for Watership Protection that residents that adjoin a wet pond, ignoring anything else, just the fact that it's a wet pond and not a dry hole in the ground, their houses that fronted those wet ponds demanded a 15% premium over those that did not because it was looked at as a positive attribute to the community. So are you, uh, it's, it sounds like you're suggesting, well, at a minimum, you're saying we need to go back and look at what's in our design manual in terms of options uh, for structural BMPs and that you may have some suggestions on how to make them 
um, better BMPs for the sake of, I don't know, uh, we, you're talking about property values, but I think it's probably more than that. But I think what you're pointing to is our options that we have available in chapter three for meeting these criteria. Well, the BMPs that are noted in chapter three have been, you know, sounds like categorized to flood control only uh, and maybe CPV. Uh, and the document that I that you guys published, I, I, I wish I had it in front of me here, but it talked about ESD uh, practices being categorized as storm, green stormware infrastructure and certain chapter three BMPs enhanced in it. And it was a table in there that said all the features that could be added to those chapter three BMPs to make them also fit the, the definition of green stormware infrastructure. And they were really nice ads, in my opinion. Uh, so I, I know the efficiencies of ponds from the fact that I've designed a ton of them. Uh, but, you know, I've also done the same with ESD practices. And I just know that they're not spatially efficient. Do they both achieve the goal? I hope so. But I just know that the ESD practices that we're offered right now, the palette, they're not spatially efficient and that uh, when we stack on these adjustments we're talking about which you know if that's going to fix climate change for us that i'm all for it but i just know that we have to make it work and i'm concerned with the ability to make it work and i'm more about getting it done right i want to get it done okay jennifer he's, he's talking about the 2021 accounting guidance for uh the MS4 community where we allow a uh, credit for certain enhanced practices uh, towards meeting um, permit requirements. Uh, that, so that's that's the, the table that Charlie's talking about. And I, I'll add that, you know, if you have suggestions about practices, that's not part of the current phase, uh, but certainly something we could consider moving forward. So again, uh, um, let us know. I, I'm trying not to be, you know, going over the edge here, as you know, Stu. I, I have to at least try to be unbiased here. Ethan, would you like to add something? Uh, sure. Um, so one of the things that we've talked with our with designers about uh, a fair amount recently has been um, in the vein of improving spatial efficiency uh, was adding enhanced filters onto the bottom of some of the existing practices. Uh, so um, uh, microbioretention with an enhanced filter underneath uh, could potentially get a greater volume in the same area. It's not as space, efi space efficient as a pond, but it's a way that some efficiency could be improved. Uh, that's an area that's really limited in the manual as it was published. Um, and it may be something that we want to expand on a lot going forward. Robert Bathurst, would you like to go ahead? How about if we read the remaining comments in the chat? Sounds good. Okay, so going back, uh, we've got Andrew responding to Justin Bell's question from earlier. I'll remind everyone the question was, how is the QP10 adjusted for climate change? And Andrew's response is, uh, doesn't Marissa just provide correction factors to be applied to what's already in Atlas 14? Their website includes projected IDF curves for different recurrence intervals in comparison to the Atlas 14 curve. Yes, yes. so just to, just, um, sorry, just to, follow up on Justin's question and Andrew's right. Um, so it would so what we're talking about are the same design storms that I, we talked about at the very beginning of, of today's discussion. Uh, we're updating those design storms with new precipitation information using Atlas 14 and then adding a climate change factor. So there's a climate change factor that comes from Marissa that's applied to each county 
Um, and that climate change factor has now been applied to each county. Uh, I think it's the county average Atlas 14 number. Uh, actually, Marissa does that for you. Um, so you take that information right out of the MRSA tool. And what we've done is we've updated then table 2.1 uh, to provide you with those numbers. So you would take the new 10-year, um, 24-hour storm event that's in table 2.1, the updated 2.1, and use that as your quantity management criteria. Okay, great. Um, all right, we've got a comment from Neil. Uh, we have to find a way to reduce existing flooding volumes in urban areas independent of shoving things into sites for retrofit development, especially on downstream development slash conveyance slash pipes. This could start to look like a CSO tunnel slash vault approach. Uh, Kim followed up with Neil, what would you suggest? And Neil made the wonderful point that it is indeed a Friday afternoon. Um, and that might be a bigger discussion than we've got time for for today. All right, and then we've just got two quick comments, or three now. Um, Mark commented, enhancements won't work on poor soils. Um, Robert commented, agree with Mark, which is a common problem west of the fall line. And Ethan just commented, Mark, the discussions included designing, designing some of the underground volume in a configuration like a SGW. Some, but not all of the volume would function like an ESD. And that catches us up. Incidentally, I just want to comment on the soils. Um, uh, poor soils, are those poor soils after development or prior to development? And um, just to let you know that we've had a lot of discussions in house about soil compaction. It, I believe it might have been presented in one of the maybe at the very beginning of the A storm process. That it's something that we'd like to consider, but it's and it's still on the table, but not currently in a proposal for a regulation update. So how was, are we doing was, on time? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I was on. talking about existing soils with high clay content, shallow groundwater, shallow bedrock, and then we okay. get into things like underground parking garages as well, but that's a whole nother set. Mm. But that's what I was talking about. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, good, good, thank you. So how are we doing on time? We are pretty much done. We are out of time at this point. Um, so I think moving on, this would be a good point to move on. Just real quick, uh, Kim commented in the city, the soils are predominantly HSGD. And Robert commented, native soils very often don't meet the 0 0.52 inches per hour. So just more, more soil comments. Okay, so topic five. I think we set aside 30 minutes for this topic as well. Um, this is the adequate downstream conveyance analysis requirement. There's two slides here I wanna go through before we start the discussion. Um, and I know there were a lot of questions and a lot of comments received on this, both in writing from our stakeholder group and in the very brief discussion we had back in April. Uh, so what we were proposing was that there was going to be a requirement that the regulatory authority require an adequate downstream stormwater conveyance analysis. This would be on all the points of discharge from a new development project. Don't recall that this was part of the redevelopment requirements, but I may be wrong. Um, it was going to be, this analysis would require that the discharge from the 10 year, 24 hour event from the site with the different discharge points does not increase downstream flood extents or cause increased erosion. The analysis had to extend to a public drainage. Public drainage was defined as either a publicly owned or maintained stormwater or drainage easement or a publicly owned or maintained stormwater conveyance or a public easement or right-of-way, or 
any other publicly owned land area. And then there was some qualifiers that said this analysis, essentially, it didn't say this exact wording, but essentially what it was trying to say was this analysis is not going to be required. In other words, the local jurisdiction could authorize a modification. So the analysis wouldn't be required when a site, when the site discharge is going directly to a public drainage or public drainage easement that is recorded in the land records. So it's a you know permanently recorded easement. Um, and then drainage easements, if they're required, if the local jurisdiction requires one, they to meet this criteria, the drainage easements would have to be large enough to contain the flood extent, the increase in the flood extent from the post-development 10-year design store. So you've got the, uh, the potential for not that, no requirement because a discharge goes directly to a public drainage easement or a public system, public conveyance system, or you've got no requirement because the discharge doesn't go to an easement or a public system, but doesn't increase the flood extents or isn't doesn't increase erosion. If it is required because there is an increase in flood extents or there is an increase in erosion, then what we have is what do you do about it? An easement could be required to contain that flood extent, or you may be requiring over management of the 10 year storm. I'm not sure how, I, I don't feel that we did a very good job presenting this, explaining it. We didn't have enough time to, to discuss it. Uh, we recognize that this is something that probably needs a lot more thought, discussion. There's a lot of uninterested questions. So I wanna put that out there right now that I don't see this moving forward in a initial set of regulation updates, but I do think it's worth discussing. Discussing, We do want to hear your concerns and comments because we do think it's important to look at downstream impacts and we want to come up with something in our regulations and our design manual that addresses this issue. So I'm going to open it up now for discussion. I anticipate there are going to be a lot of questions and comments. All right, the first person to raise their hand was Matt Johnston. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks, Jennifer. So one of the things that we've noticed for a long time, and I think I've mentioned in other work group meetings in Anne Arundel County, is we'll see uh, no ero erosivity in the channel at the point of investigation, at the discharge point. But then you go, I don't care if it's 50, 100, 500 feet down, and that additional volume is what caused this, the uh, waters of the state channel to erode down in the receiving stream. So that's been one of my biggest uh, requests for this whole uh, process was to define for counties how far down we go for the point of investigation or if that point of investigation should have some sort of flexible criteria. So any, any response to that point? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to go back to this slide before, Matt. Uh, there was something in our proposal that tried to assist with how far down to go on the analysis. I'm not sure that this is going to be. I know there's a lot of questions with this, and and but I will just let you know what it says. Okay, so we said you have to go down to the next public drainage, the public drainage. Okay, so we had a little we had a little um, figure that I can pull up if anybody wants me to, that kind of explains what that is, but essentially it means from the discharge point of your development down to either a publicly owned or maintained stormwater or drainage easement, or from the discharge point down to the first publicly owned or maintained stormwater conveyance, or down to the first public easement or right away, or some publicly owned land area. So essentially we're looking at you analyzing down to some, some type of public owned, maintained system, you're, man you're analyzing between your discharge point to that public system, public easement. All right, Mark Etheridge, you had your hand up next. Yeah, 
thank you for this slide. This is good, and thanks for this this uh, opportunity to discuss this. This is extremely important, but there's a lot of aspects to it. Just what you're talking about just now with the uh, the, the study for erosiveness and how far down to go. One of the impediments we have to getting good downstream studies like this is we don't have access or the engineers don't have access to many of these private properties to actually do topo. So we're working with some generalized topography. So we are a bit limited in getting a lot of detail on that. Um, we do look at the erosiveness when it leaves the property to make sure it's not erosive. I have to think that's probably about as far as we can go in most cases, but we can certainly discuss that. I think it's important, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to shut up here in a minute and not talk anymore. I think it's important to understand that there are two types of things we're looking at here. We're talking about environmental mitigation, which erosivity is certainly part of it. But what we really get into the, the headaches part of it is, is property protection. That's a whole other issue of um, civil court, civil issues, non-environmental issues. Environmental issues are across the board. They're quantifiable. They're something we can, we can address and we can require people to, to comply with. These, these more lot-to-lot -lot property protection issues involve damage claims, concerns that need to be adjudicated. Um, they are not something that happens in every case as opposed to environmental mitigations where we can address this in every case. Every issue of an increased runoff from one property to another does not cause a problem. In fact, the vast majority that we see in the county don't cause problems. The few that do are very vocal and they are real and they count and they should be addressed. But we need to really keep those, keep in mind the separation there of what we're doing. We can't say if someone's claim is valid or not in terms of property damage or concern for property damage. That has to be judged and judges, judges judge, right? Not environmental reviewers. We have to look at that and make sure we, we keep that dichotomy. We have to keep the civil issue in the civil realm. I'm all for requiring these developers to do downstream analyses, and we do that currently. I'm all for having them sign runoff statements or runoff certifications where they say, I understand what my responsibilities are with respect to runoff from my, my development as it affects adjacent properties, and we do that now but we're limited into what we can really do. When we start putting restrictions on things and we start taking that responsibility away from the engineers and the designers and saying, as long as you do A, B, and C, you're absolved from all sin and, and we'll take the responsibility for any damage that occurs, we're gonna be in a really tough spot. Um, it's a shame that this has to be a civil issue and some people have to talk to their um, legal counsel if something happens to them. I think that's part of the reality, but we can do a better job I think we do a better job with better notifications to these engineers, putting their names on the line and saying, well, we're going to, we're going to give this stuff to the court and you can stand up in court and say, yeah, I did this because your name's going to be on there saying that you understand this is your responsibility, but thank so, you for putting the slide up and thank you for having this as a discussion. Okay. Thanks Mark. I just wanted to clarify one thing that I didn't put on here. Um, I don't even know if we said it back in April, but there's a, currently a, a requirement in our regulations that talk about some of the things you mentioned, Mark, where the developer takes the responsibility mm -hmm. or the developer is not, is, is, he still has a responsibility to. I can almost work. quote it for you. Please do, because I can't. <laughs> it's in state model ordinances, right? It, it says that this, this approval is for the purpose, I'll, I'll paraphrase, it's for the purpose of stormwater management compliance that does not remove the responsibility from the developer for the, res, for the results of their, their runoff, basically what it says. Yeah, I something like that. So, but so there's, yeah, there's, to clarify that this is for environmental purposes, right? Yeah, well, that's. So I guess what I'm pointing to is that there is a statement in our regulations that talk about the responsibility of the developer for downstream impacts. That is going to remain. So I want to make sure that you understand that that, that what we're proposing here is in addition to what is already currently in the regulations that will not go away. Yeah, I talked to so many people, including land attorneys, who had no idea still with all this stuff in the regs that an approval of a stormwater management plan doesn't absolve them from responsibility. They are astounded. So that's why we're having people actually sign a statement on their plans. The engineer signs it, says, I understand what's in the regs. I understand 
that you're not approving all of the things associated with runoff here. I have a real responsibility under Maryland Civil Code. And we actually put together a little a fact sheet on this that we hand out to folks as well. But I think we could do a lot more to just bring this into clarity with the design community and, and with the legal community to make sure they understand the ramifications of some of the designs that they're, that they're producing. Thanks, guys. Okay, thank you. And Mary Giles, you have your hand up, and it looks like you also added something in the chat. If you'd like to go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I'm just trying to understand this analysis because the new this draft new code is requiring uh, a land development project to attenuate or reduce their ten-year discharge rate back to pre-development. So, by definition, the the way I'm thinking of it is by definition the downstream conditions not going to be impacted because they're holding it back on their site and releasing it slowly, you know, so I'm confused. Therefore I'm confused. Like what, what is this analysis, this downstream analysis, if, if they're already required to attenuate the 10 year increase. Mine is a question. <laughs> Mary, I have to think about your question because something doesn't quite seem right. Uh, Stu, do you have any response to that while I'm looking back at our proposal? It, it's, it's not just, I mean, Mary, I'll just kind of add to that and, and, and some of the side chats going on here. It's not necessarily about the pre and post. It could also be changing from uh, sheet flow to concentrated flow, or, or, or you know, uh, it's it, when you're talking about discharge of runoff from one property to another. The civil law often states that the, the uh, change of the way runoff flows onto or off of the adjacent property, and and you know that's the responsibility of, of between the two people involved. And so, you know, yeah, you could say, and this this has happened in the past where somebody comes in and says, I've um, provided 10-year peak management down to pre-development conditions, but the, mm -hmm. the the situation wasn't that. It was that you've changed it from a concert, you know, from a sheet flow condition to a concentrated flow condition, and now I've got this managed yeah. property uh, discharging directly onto to my property that that it's, you know now requires an easement or some other legal. Okay document to to you know show that i have accepted this runoff and so yeah, yeah. the civil law becomes very complicated in that respect and marcus you know pointed mm -hmm. out we have a requirement in the regs it's been in there since at least i want to say 2000 if not uh, but but that basically says it's it's not the approval of stormwater management plan does not convey property rights to to the, the developer it's the developer's responsibility Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. So that's why it's so tied to extend it to a public system. Right. Right. Yeah. The public system, you as the local jurisdiction are the property owners. Right. The right. Custodian. Right. So you grant those rights. It's when the, 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 the uh, receiving property is not public. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. That, that makes it a little clearer to me. <laughs> but your, your point is, is a good point. It's actually something that we will be discussing. We'll discuss it, uh, uh, Mary, because I. It, it's too obvious for us to not have already thought about this, but I can't remember. <laughs> Sorry, it's I, remember. I mean, when you got a you know, ten acres and it's sheet flowing off a of property into somebody's little agricultural ditch. And then instead you pave the whole thing and you put it in a pipe and you stick a pipe to right before the property line. Now you've sent all that drainage to one location instead of, so I, I, I guess I get what, probably more from an erosion standpoint than from a convey, you know, I probably the flood extent isn't going to change, but the erosion could, could, because you're really concentrating it all in one location. So I guess I understand what's doing saying in that regard. Yes, go ahead, Stu. I mean, I just want to add that, that, you know, it has been our experience. We've seen numerous situations uh, from a, a, a stormwater management pond being designed to discharge 
at or near the property line, it met all peak management requirements. But the, that outfall is pointed right at somebody's back door on the next property over. Or um, um, we have, uh, you know, seen issues in our office where, you know, one property owner changed the way they're downspout off of the roof leaders into the new property owner. And, and, you know, we've got caught up in some of those. So it really, it's not just that it's not just that this downstream conveyance issue is not necessarily a peak management issue. It is, you know, if you change the way water flows onto or off of a property, you could be potentially long. That's what the, 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 the crux of the civil issue is. And so, you know, it, it, it could be, um, and Kim pointed out here that, you know, what about upstream? Well, if, if, if you put a dam across your lot and pond water on the upstream property owner's uh, lot without his permission, that's, that's equally um, subject under the civil law, but, uh, not something we see as often in stormwater management. Stu, I think you missed my meaning. I was really talking, you've got a lot of focus on what's happening downstream from a flooding, but because of the nature of a lot of the ways that the designs are done, um, unless you're certain that your, your collection system is in a sump in some way there's a possibility that during that 10-year storm if you've not sized your upstream conveyance correctly you may not be capturing all of that 10-year storm to be mitigating in the first place that's where i was going with it okay i can see that too i mean we, we um one of the earlier ones i got meshed in was down in in one of the southern maryland counties where the water actually there was an easement for the water to flow across the downstream property but the water wasn't flowing in that easement and so that property owner was able to and successfully sue for damages on the upstream property owner because they said, I have allowed water to flow in this narrow confine, but not outside of it. And so, I mean, it, it, it's um, it's a difficult situation that we've been grappling with for years to, 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 to address. And, and that's why we're reaching out to everyone here in this community about how best we can address this because the current state of affairs is, is unsustainable, I think is a, is a good way to put it. Radu has his hand up. Just go ahead. Yeah. Yes, uh, on, on this topic, and I I guess in the end, yes, I, I, I would support the 10 year as being the upper benchmark on it because, well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Maryland law is, well, pretty explicit in its structure. It's, it's the natural flow rule compounded by the reasonable use. It does not refer, though, to a specific storm. So essentially, you can have deleterious effects on a neighboring property regardless of the storm and you're still just as liable um probably stopping it at 10 years is enough uh i know that i mean baltimore county at least and probably other jurisdictions as well m require that well up to 100 year storm be made contained into a public right of way of sorts or easements um but it at least up to the 10 year storm, I can see the usability and value of, of um, doing this type of an analysis. It's, it's, I think, kind of essential. At least it makes clear what the impacts could be. Okay, great. Really great discussion here. Uh, moving to some chat questions. I've got a question from Kim Grove. Uh, shouldn't there also be an adequate upstream conveyance? It sounds simple, but if the on-site collection system to the BMP does not include a sump condition, there is a potential of bypass. Intensity matters. And Andrew Miller uh, also agrees that intensity matters. In the next comment. All right, we've got... Oh. Yep, we've got a question from Glenn in the chat. Uh, does the adequacy slash capacity of downstream storm drain systems come into play? So I'll, I'll just say, Glenn, that that was the intention. Whether this is actually doing that, I'm not sure. But the intention is also to consider the fact that downstream conveyance may not have capacity. So. Um, 
I don't know that we actually are doing what we intend to do with the proposals, and we will definitely keep that question in mind. Yes, yeah, Stu, go ahead. Uh, just to add on to what Jennifer said there, you know, the adequate capacity of the downstream conveyance system, in the case, you know, talking about downstream storm drain system, um, if that's a publicly owned storm drain system, then the local approval authority is the, the custodian for that system. And they can say, no, you can't discharge to our system unless you do X, Y, or Z, and, and maybe make sure that your discharge is uh, not going to, to affect the capacity of that system. Again, you know, it's your system. If that's a private system, hey, that's that's again, let's go back to, to that's between two private entities and, and we're kind of stuck in the middle there. So, uh, but, uh, you know, it, that could be where the, the developer tells the other entity, I'll upgrade the system, how about that? You know, I mean, that's between them. But uh, if you're the owner, you know, there's an opportunity maybe to get it upgrades or, or adequacy of public facilities, that storm drain system isn't adequate, what do we do, you know? Um, you know, consider the opportunities here. I'm not sure this was um, brought up by anybody earlier, but one thing that uh, since we're, we have you here today, if you could also consider this criteria separate from the tenure management criteria, if this was, uh, if this was a criteria we had, but we didn't have the tenure management criteria, would, what would be the concerns? Because I do think by standalone, there are concerns, but when you throw in the fact that we have the tenure management criteria, you might think this isn't an issue anymore. And I, I, I really want to use this opportunity to get from you. If we did require this, what, what would be the issues without the tenure management? Okay. Um, question from Neil in the chat. Could there be some consideration for enhancements in EJ areas, maybe some incentive or additional volume? So we would have, I, I think what you're suggesting is that we have maybe even a, we would have even a more restrictive requirement in an EJ community. Would we consider that? I think is what you're asking. Uh, yeah, or not restrictive, but maybe en enhancements, or if it's flooding in that area, um, or the system's adequate, some incentive to increase the capacity of that system based on the new criteria that we're doing. Yeah, I think that um, it's not in. I, I don't know that it's in this criteria. This criteria, but it is in the overall approach that we want to take as a whole, which includes performing watershed studies to understand the issues of existing flooding concerns, because right now we're talking about development and redevelopment, but we also have these existing flooding concerns out there that may not be addressed by redevelopment and new development. Maybe we need to look at identifying those problems, understanding what is causing them, and then potentially coming up with an alternative requirement if there is development in that watershed. Kind of goes back to what we what Kim was talking about with the watershed ap uh, approach to alternative compliance. Right, and then you could look upstream, downstream. You could see where the issues were in the area. You could see where you want to incentivize using your stormwater infrastructure um, instead of a vault. Yes. Or enhanced ponds. Correct. So we need to look at this as multiple different um, facets to what stormwater management, not just new development criteria. All right, uh, next up we've got a question from Kim, although I'm not positive what this is in reference to, so Kim, feel free to jump in. Uh, she asked, uh, pre-development or existing conditions? That was previously when we were talking about the, um, where Jennifer was talking about the control and, some, and somebody was giving the example, they were using the term pre-development. 
And in my mind, for redevelopment projects, um, pre-development means before any development came. It almost takes us back to that woods in good condition, which I is not the goal of the 10 year at this time. Um, so just wanted to make sure we aren't interchanging words of pre-development versus existing conditions because that's it makes a difference. Great, and thank you for that. All right, next we've got a couple of comments in the chat. We've got one from Mark. Uh, we also shy away from having engineers design 10-year attenuation practices on residential properties to address safe conveyance, since these probably don't really have the desired effect in the first place and are very unlikely to be properly maintained over time. We've got a comment from Justin next. It can be difficult to differentiate between a single site contribution to negative to negative impacts on downstream properties when there's significant off-site runoff contributing to the same downstream conveyance path. And finally, we've got one from Matt. Uh, when we do not adequately protect the waters of the state from erosion and private and public properties from flooding downstream uh, of a point of investigation that is cited to close to the development itself, then we, state and counties, are on the hook to spend a ton of taxpayer dollars for stormwater slash stream slash floodplain restoration. Moving that point of investigation adequately downstream of the discharge, a thousand feet or so, would solve a lot of this. And a comment just came in from Jeffrey in the chat. I want to ensure publicly owned land area does not mean SHA right of way. Hmm. Good. Good point, Jeff. We'll keep that in mind. Um, I think I think what you mean is you don't want a county or local jurisdiction making decisions on impacts that might happen to state right away, and that would have include all state properties and all federal properties. So yeah, I think we have to be careful with that language. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. Well, that is everything from the chat. Right now, we've got about a minute left before the half hour time slot is up. Yes, Justin Bell, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, you know, just express some concern from the, the design perspective and even from just anything of, you know, the further downstream you go for your, your POI, um, I can just envision and see, you know, situations where um, a study for negative impacts or what's the impact downstream uh, goes from, you know, capacity of the conveyance to now uh, almost turning into like a sub watershed uh, study um, to, to make those determinations and it kind of balloons into the level of effort. Um, and I'm just trying to find, you know, what's that, that path that, um, you know, gets you a adequate uh, understanding of uh, is your site going to cause you know potential you know negative or is the capacity of the downstream receiving um, conveyance uh, you know uh, acceptable um, or are you know you're gonna need to what what information is available to you to make that determination so some of my concerns they're good points thank you You got one more in the chat. Yep. Um, all right. Comment from Rick. My comment isn't for the requirement of safe conveyance. Rather, that safe conveyance computations are required in my community at time of development um, stormwater management reports, which is timed with planning site plan approval. Possibly final stormwater management approval is also an equally acceptable time for a safe conveyance study. I think Rick, that would I think that would be achieved because approval wouldn't happen until that analysis is completed. And the result of that analysis is determined. Now I guess maybe what you are also referring to is let's say that analysis pointed to the need to get an easement downstream, that you wouldn't want the plan to be approved until that easement is 
obtain. I think, so you basically are talking about the full thing, not just the analysis, but the result of the analysis, whatever management or requirement is completed, I think is what you're saying. If I'm wrong, please add to what you're saying, if you will. Jennifer, yes, I appreciate the additional color that you've provided to my comment. Um, what I meant was is that at planning time, plans engineers aren't really trying to fully develop a, a whole stormwater report, stormwater report, just trying to get an, an answer to move that project down further. And the the time crunch that I, I feel developers are saying at planning um, site plans, it you know, they they just want to get their project approved so they can get to the next stage, which at final they're have more money, more time, more effort that they can associate. And safe conveyance could be a stormwater pipe analysis, or it could be a full, full blown, you know, whatever. It could it could be there there's two scales here that we, we could look at and the, the ends are are great compared to each other. So um I, I think basically what I'm saying is that I I believe our ordinance, our model ordinance came from MDE. So we copied it to say that safe conveyance had to come at time of development. And and possibly we could add, we could just say, hey, we'd prefer to change our ordinance so that it would come. So maybe this doesn't apply to everybody, but I believe that's where it came from. So, you know, that I'm just reverbing back to you that uh, it, it seems that, you know, we, we also allow it to go to final um, if engineers are, are saying, hey, we, we can handle this later. It's it's not so much needed right now at planning with development. Stu, you got your hand raised? Yeah, so what I'm hearing, and this is not necessarily, this is good input. This is not necessarily a bad suggestion. I'm not quite sure how we would do it, but that this whole idea of adequate conveyance and whether or not you have rights to discharge on the downstream property or the upstream property should come earlier in the development process and maybe not be left up to the, the stormwater management plans reviewer to be the last person signing the set of plans and holding up the stop sign saying you can't do this. Um, you know, I, I, that's not necessarily a bad idea, but I, you know, I, I'd like suggestions on, on necessarily who, who would, be the right people to do that and how would we you know remember we're, we're stormwater regulators how would we get in touch with these people and maybe get them to be more sensitive to this issue so i throw that out there as a question to you guys because that's not that's not a bad suggestion to getting that earlier in the process it's just that how that how would we as a community uh get that to work We've got a couple hands raised. Robert Bathurst, uh, you can go first. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, you know, I also want to highlight something that's just a real thing, right? Statistics, meaning that uh, we're talking about modeling a ten-year storm. Statistically, this is something we're going to examine that occurs once every ten years, assuming a twenty-four-hour storm, like unit hydrograph storm as being representative of, of defending against this issue, which I understand the need for a baseline, but I just want to highlight the obvious that, you know, the spatial distribution of rainfall isn't uniform, and this would assume that. And it also, Mother Nature doesn't like to follow the rules very often. <laughs> so it's a baseline, but, you know, it's not necessarily going to represent reality. Okay, and Radu, your hand is up next. Uh, yes, to to that end, and in, in uh, it, I support the idea of running that type of conveyance analysis in the planning stage. In fact, as um, overall, it, uh, the 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 context is: Are you putting together a site plan that is going to be attentful and careful for how it discharges on who or are you putting together a site plan that eventually will get approved and built anyways and uh, i 
by seeing what I've seen through years here in Baltimore County, I would not go that, that latter route. Okay, I'm gonna jump in here. Um, we only have four minutes left. We could probably talk for another couple hours. Definitely, I know that the downstream conveyance system and maybe even the quantity management discussion needs to continue. I want to talk about our next steps over the next couple months. As I said, we have been working over the summer to look at, you know, reviewing the comments that we received so far. We will definitely be taking all of your comments into account as we mentioned them today and in, in from the last meetings. We have made changes to our proposals. Um, we need to get them out to our stakeholder advisory group members to comment on. So they will be coming out very, very soon, like next couple of weeks. So if you are a stakeholder advisory group member, look for them. If you're not, and you have the ability to uh, discuss with those members, please feel free to. Um, I mentioned that case studies. We received an EPA grant, which I'm really excited about, uh, to run some of our proposals through some case study analyses. We've got, we're kind of limited though, because we're not de the development community. Um, we need some assistance. If any of you have case studies that are plans that you propose that aren't too complex, we're looking for uh, stormwater management reports and, and plan sets that we could look at and see, do some simple analysis to uh, look at the impacts if we required, look at the impacts on the stormwater design if we required these new criteria. We're looking for commercial, residential, multifamily, and residential single family uh, case studies. Have any of that, anything that you might want to, or that might be available for us to use? Contact Stu, I've got his contact information on the next slide. Um, Again, we're going to be looking at a very simple analysis assessing impacts and benefits to uh, applying the new criteria. And then I also want to throw out there that we've got a watershed studies tag meeting October 1st. Um, guess what, guys? The watershed tag, you've been hearing from us for at least two years now. We put in these grants, we put in these grants. We finally got our notification of award for the three $1 million grants from FEMA to do the three different watershed projects. One is prioritizing watersheds for the state. The second one is developing a framework for how to do a watershed study for local jurisdictions. And then the third one is to do some uh, watershed studies as pilot projects. So we're moving forward with those grants. Uh, we wanna talk about them again with the watershed tag. We wanna talk about also other, um, even future, uh, uh, approaches to watershed management, stormwater management, and specifically talk about watershed-based governance. I know that that's a topic that has recently been coming to more in discussion with the Baltimore Urban Waters Partnership. So uh, if you are a member of the Watershed Tag, please uh, uh, look for a, an announcement on the October 1st meeting. Other than that, um, it's three o'clock. I think we're going to have to shut this down now, uh, but please, again, feel free to send us in any comments. Give us a call if you have questions or comments. And if it's if you feel the, that it's, it would be really important and beneficial to have a follow up meeting, let us know. And other than that, thank you for coming and spending the afternoon with us and have a nice weekend.